Let me start by saying that it's a huge pleasure and an honor for me as a humble scholar to get to talk to this distinguished forum of people. I am a great admirer of the Center for Research Libraries and of the Cooperative Africana Materials Project, and uh, to have a chance to talk to you all is a, is a pleasure, so thank you. Um, I first started working in Uganda in the mid-2000s when I was teaching at the University of Cambridge in the UK. It quickly became apparent to me that the infrastructure for historical research in that country was exceedingly patchy. All over the country, tucked away in attics and basements and sheds surrounding government buildings, I found piles of moldy, decaying paperwork. In one place, in western Uganda, the archive was kept in an attic. Uh, there were so many wasps that it was difficult to get in the door. In another place, also in the west, the archive of the local kingdom government was tucked in a cellar underneath the local council chamber. To get into the archive, you had to vault over a pile of disused cyclostyling machines, photocopiers, bicycles, and sinks, slalom down the other side, and there lay the older files at the other end of the basement. In a third place, off in eastern Uganda, the local government archive was kept in a shed behind the district headquarters. Termites had built a nest behind the building, turning the government paperwork into mulch. Now, the dire condition of Uganda's public record has long been the subject of concern among Ugandan intellectuals and academics. But in the absence of political will and financial support, it's been difficult to act upon those concerns. In 2009, I had the good fortune to be hired by the University of Michigan, where I now teach. And that year, just before I moved from Cambridge to Ann Arbor, I worked with colleagues at the local government institution in Fort Portal Town to relocate one endangered collection, which had previously be kept, been kept in this building, from the attic to the university's campus, which is in the center of this provincial city in the west of Uganda. It was hard work. There were so many wasps in that attic that uh, we had to spend a week spraying them with an insecticide. I remember standing back to back with a records officer with two cans of doom in hand, spraying the wasps as they dive bombed us from on high. Uh, in the ensuing months, I worked with colleagues at Mountains of the Moon University, as the institution is called, to develop a plan for cataloging and preserving that important collection. I was able to tap funds first from the University of Michigan and latterly from the Center for Research Libraries uh, Cooperative Africana Materials Project. Groups of students from Michigan worked with colleagues at MMU to sort, clean, catalog, and eventually to digitize the whole of the collection. By the end of 2011, this first collection had been fully digitized. And over the ensuing years, I've been working with colleagues at MMU to acquire and organize and digitize additional collections. We've been able now to digitize fully four local government archives from the west of Uganda. Today, the digital repository at this remote provincial university in western Uganda consists of about 500,000 scans making it the largest single digital collection of government documents in Africa, as far as I know. Alongside this digitizing work, I've been every year recruiting students from uh, Ann Arbor and from uh, a variety of African institutions to organize and describe uh, endangered government archives. So in 2011 and 2012, a team from Makedida University in Uganda worked with students from Michigan to organize and describe the National Archives of Uganda, which had not previously been available in full for research. In 2012, a team from Ann Arbor worked with colleagues in South Sudan to organize and describe the archives of, the, uh, of South Sudan, which was then the world's newest country. The archives had been kept in this tent. The students moved them into a new concrete building adjoining the tent where they were uh, put on eventually deposit uh, for research. They're now being digitized by another organization. In 2013, we had a team in Michigan in southern Uganda, from Michigan in southern Uganda, working with students in Kabbalah University to organize and describe the district's archives there. Uh, and in 2015, we had a large team of Michigan students, along with students from Busoga University in eastern Uganda, who took on the Jinja district archives, the largest of Uganda's provincial archival collection. That archive was underwater when we arrived in Jinja. It was kept in a basement below the government headquarters. Uh, 
uh, when it rained, the water ran in from above ground uh, and flooded the basement, exposing the, lower, the papers on the lower shelves to water on an annual basis. We brought the files up, up above ground, dried everything out, scraped off the mud, organized the files, and created a catalog for the whole collection. The catalog itself runs to uh, 800 pages. The newest iteration of this ongoing work was launched in mid-January when colleagues and I from, uh, from Michigan set up a scanning project at the Uganda Broadcasting Corporation in Kampala. The project is focused on the digitization of the UBC's massive collection of photo negatives, which stretch back as far as the 1950s. There's over 50,000 large format negatives along with 25,000, 20,000 rather, 35 millimeter negatives. Most of them have never been printed. Uh, by the end of the year, we hope to have digitized the most substantial part of that archive and to make it available for researchers who come to Kampala and work with the UBC's curators to access the collection. There's another project underway as well. Uh, this upcoming summer, there will be a team in Kampala working at this building, the High Court in Kampala, to organize and catalog the extensive collection of legal archives kept uh, by the court. Once it's available, the High Court of Uganda archive will be the largest archive for legal history research in Africa. It consists of thousands of files, case files, that is, pertaining to litigation launched by African litigants from the 1940s through to recent times. For me, as a researcher, all of this is a source of great pride. For Ugandan students and researchers, as for students and researchers from the United States and other places, the new availability of accessible, organized, and in many cases digitized collections is a great boon. It's enabled new kinds of research on a great number of subjects that have previously been closed to scholars of Uganda's past. And yet, at least for the moment, all of the work that I've done in Uganda has not yet fed into what is called here the global information supply chain. American universities have not been the ending place for these materials. Like governments everywhere, Uganda's government has secrets to keep and histories to forget. Officials are concerned about losing control over official information as we speak the legal status of the digital archive that I've created with Ugandan colleagues in the west of Uganda is in limbo as myself and my colleagues argue over its future with powerful officials in Uganda's government. The digital archive at Mountains of the Moon University is only accessible to researchers and students who get themselves to Fort Portal, which is a remote provincial town off in the west, and physically present themselves in this room where the archive is kept. They have to consult it on the laptop that's shown off on the left, which is connected with a large capacity Drobo drive that my colleagues and I installed in the middle of last year. Digital technology has greatly enriched global access to information. It's allowed the free transfer of archival scans and other textual, visual, and sonic material across space quickly and effectively. It's made it possible to think about supply chains for libraries in the global north in new and exciting ways. But today, access to government information in the global south, as it sounds also in the global north, remains politically and administratively uh, controversial. Even as new technologies enable the easy and apparently fluid transfer of images and text from one place to the other, governments concerned about open access have uh, 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 created new regimes, legal and administrative, to superintend and limit the free flow of material. New technologies, in other words, have entailed new kinds of blockages. So in this very short time I've got, I want to simply describe, by reference to Uganda, which is the place that I know best, uh, I want to show how the tension between portability and constraint, between the demands for access and official interest and closure, have defined the politics of information management in Eastern Africa over the long term. Standing here and now, in the middle of an ongoing digital revolution in information management, it's easy to see ourselves as prospectors looking about for new collections that can be vacuumed up into the digital interface. I think it's important instead to see our current moment in relation to the history of information management uh, in Africa and in other places. There's long been debates over access, control, and preservation. 
their dilapidated, experience, uh, their dilapidated appearance notwithstanding, the government archives with which I've been working in Uganda have not, in fact, been laying inert, waiting for myself and my colleagues to attend to them. There's a history of custodianship there that demands attention. The dilapidation of the paper archive in Uganda, as elsewhere in other parts of the Global South, is, in many ways, a deliberate strategy of neglect. Neglect is not simply forgetfulness. It's also a means of uh, burying things, of making things forgettable. The disinvestment in historic preservation in Uganda is a way of limiting the exposure of the current order to the extremities and traumas of the past. It reflects the fragility of political consensus and the urgency with which the current government in Uganda is distancing Uganda from its traumatic and divisive history. So, in Uganda, as in many other parts of the colonial world, the years immediately following the Second World War saw a vast inflation in the amount of paperwork that governments generated. This is what historians call the development era. It was a time in African history when British, French, and other European administrators set out to transform their African empires after the war in the name of developmentalism. In 1950, Uganda received a new consignment of Remington typewriters from Britain. Obsolete machines were replaced, and a new typing pool staffed with a dozen British women was created. These typists served an ever-expanding bureaucracy, and new routines were created to uh, organize the working of that expanded, departmentalized government, which was newly constituted uh, in the years following the war. Confidential correspondence between government, corris government departments was placed in color-coded metal boxes, which were locked with keys kept in the personal position of high-ranking government officials. There were, among other uh, colors, five black boxes, which were used only by the governor and the chief secretary. Only three people had keys to those five black boxes, which were used to trans uh, transfer highly confidential material. There were good use of reasons why British bureaucrats in Uganda sought to limit uh, unauthorized access to government paperwork. In the early and mid-1950s, the Uganda government, probably more than any other African colony, felt itself to be under examination from skeptical and critical British and African activists. In 1953, Uganda's ham-fisted governor, a man named Andrew Cohen, had deposed the ruler of the Kingdom of Buganda, whose photograph with his ministers is on the screen. The ruler of the kingdom is called the Kabaka. He was deposed in 1953 for refusing to cooperate with the government's prerogatives. The Kabaka was unceremoniously bundled off in an airplane and sent into exile in London, where he thereafter set about with his colleagues organizing a campaign to secure his return to the throne. Within weeks, Ganda activists had organized a sophisticated organization that drew from, among other things, alliances in the Church of England and in the Tory party, the Conservative Party, to place pressure on the Uganda government to see to the restoration of the Kabaka. Ganda lawyers, who were trained in British universities and law schools, brought the case before the British courts. This legal and political pressure ultimately compelled the Uganda government to reverse course. In 1955, the Kabaka, the ruler of the kingdom, was restored to his position and returned with great ceremony to Entebbe Airport. It's not a coincidence that British bureaucrats and archivists engaged by skillful campaigners who were critical of official policy would, in the mid-1950s, adopt new routines meant to secure their paperwork. That's where the architecture, the legal architecture of official policy regarding access began. It was a legal strategy. It was meant to limit critics and jurists' access to incriminating information. In 1955, the British government for the first time appointed an archivist in Uganda. His name was J.P.M. Fowl to supervise the, the archives that were crowding the archive repository in the Secretariat's basement, which is shown on the screen here. Older files dating to the late 19th century up to the year 1902 were rather reluctantly made available for researchers to use. More contemporary paperwork was strictly out of bounds. In 1953, 1956 rather, the chief secretary told a group of researchers from Makerere University 
to leave footnotes out of their academic papers, that is, footnotes for, which refer to government publications. The government was nervous, he said, that uh, archives which ought not be known to exist in the public domain would be uh, injudiciously identified in scholars' footnotes. They were anxious, as he said, to avoid promoting an embarrassing series of demands for access to government archives which would only have to be refused. <laughs> the Uganda government's aversion to academic research was reinforced in December 1958 when the Public Records Act was adopted by the British Parliament. It established a 50-year rule for access to government records in Britain and in its colonies. Now, the foreclosure of historical research on Uganda was not effective without controversy. Historians, anthropologists, and other scholars put pressure on government bureaucrats, arguing for greater transparency and greater access. In 1961, for example, a young American named Richard Rotberg, pursuing research on the origins of African nationalism, requested access to confidential files. When he was refused access, he published an editorial in the Manchester Guardian complaining about the Uganda government's policy limiting access to official information. Professor Rotberg couldn't have known that at the very time he was conducting his research, government officials in Uganda were conducting a massive campaign to purge, redact, and reorganize the official archive. It was called Operation Legacy. Operation Legacy was the British government's effort to limit what the independent governments of post-colonial Africa and other post-colonial states in the British Empire could know about the colonial states that they had been displaced. By the early 1960s, the constitutions of uh, independent African countries were being negotiated in London. Government ministries were increasingly headed by African politicians who were members of nationalist parties. Operation Legacy was driven by British officials' conviction, as they said, that we must not pass on any material to African governments which might first embarrass Her Majesty's government or second, lead to the identification of a source of police intelligence. A great amount of material had to be edited out of the archival record. You'll see the list here. This is the official guidance paper regarding Operation Legacy. Among other things, government officers were supposed to delete that is to weed out papers pertaining to, among other things, the subversive activities of the Indian government or papers which might show, as they said, racial discrimination against Africans or Negroes in the United States on behalf of Her Majesty's government. In February of 1961, government officers in Uganda were instructed to split their files in two. That is, they were to create a separate file series, which was labeled DG, where controversial papers were to be placed. Once the controversial papers had been taken away, <clears throat> the public file, which was called a legacy file, was to be handed on to African archivists and officials to use. The parallel series of secret papers, the DG file, the whole existence of that DG file was to be kept secret. And in fact, over the course of months, British officials in Uganda spent a lot of time inking out with an obliterating agent cross-references to papers that they had taken away from the files that they'd pruned. It was a massive undertaking. In the chief minister's office alone, there were some 1,500 DG files created between January and October 1961. All of it had to be done secretly because by this time there were already African ministers in government responsible for the archives. Most of the DG files were sent temporarily to Entebbe and later transported onward to London. The Royal Navy is said to have carried 30 cubic feet of papers from Uganda to London in April 1962. A further collection of archives was sent via the Royal Air Force six days before Ugandan independence. The same thing, ladies and gentlemen, was happening all over the British Empire. The British government of Malaya prepared for independence in 1957 by sending five truckloads of government papers to the Royal Navy base in Singapore, where they were destroyed in the Navy's incinerator. In North Borneo, 300 files were burnt in the governor's mansion, and a 55, uh, 55 further secret files were transferred to the High Commissioner's office directly before independence. In the Gold Coast, which became independent in 1957 as the new country of Ghana, 15 bags of top secret information were secretly moved to London 
By 1995, after decades of pruning, sorting, and evacuating controversial material, the British had accumulated some 16,000 shelf feet of government records in a military installation called Hanslope Park, a top secret military installation where the files generated by this pruning of the official archive were kept. There were always loose ends. I don't have time to talk in great detail about African government's efforts to reclaim archives which had been kept back from them upon the occasion of independence. Most famously, the Kenya government organized a campaign to secure the return of the secret Operation Legacy papers, resulting in 2012 in the admission by the British government of the existence of this archive and subsequently in the British government's admission in Parliament to having tortured Mau Mau detainees in detention camps over the course of the 1950s. Back in Uganda, in Uganda, as in many other parts of post-colonial Africa, African-run governments inherited from their uh, colonial predecessors a profound aversion to historical research. The first government of independent Uganda was headed by this man, Milton Obote, who had, like his British predecessors, an exceedingly antagonistic relationship with the Kingdom of Uganda. In 1967, he sent in the army to destroy the kingdom's administrative center, and thereafter he outlawed the kingdom altogether, dividing it up into different districts and exiling its king a second time. Milton Obote's government had reason to regard academic research as a source of political controversy. In 1966, in October, a few months after the army had sacked the palace of the King of Buganda, the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Regional Administrations complained, as he said, that he was inundated with numerous requests from the university for research on certain fields of administration. He warned that his ministry was, as he said, highly inflammable, and publication of certain aspects of it would cause government serious embarrassment. In the late 60s, therefore, the Obote government was as strict as, as its British predecessor had been in limiting researchers' access to official information. No one was allowed to see files that were more than 50 years old, neither were they allowed to see any file that was not immediately related to the avowed subject of their research. Ironically, Idi Amin's government, which came to power in 1971, was remarkably effective about the accumulation and preservation of paperwork. Uh, Amin overthrew President Obote in January 1971. He came to power promising to launch a new epoch in Uganda's history. He claimed to be developing Uganda, as he said many times, at a supersonic speed. Everyone involved in the Amin regime seems to have felt obliged to produce reports that could offer testimony and evidence of the work that they've been performing. Thus, Uganda's archive repositories today are bulging with an overabundance of papers produced by anxious, low-level bureaucrats who were keenly working to demonstrate their eff efficiency to demanding superiors. The 1970s were a time when, really for the first time in Uganda's history, there was an avowed interest in creating an archival record that could testify in the public interest to the accomplishments of the time. Uh, in the Uganda Museum, for instance, for the first time, the curator in 1971 began to acquire newspapers. This is the acquisitions catalog on the screen. You'll see that he's lists, listed the contents of each newspaper in handwriting over on the right side of the, of the book. At the same time, the curators began to acquire objects that seemingly testified to the rapid pace of change that Uganda was going through under the Amin government. A whole bunch of stuff, as you can see from the screens, this is another page from the acquisitions catalog, a whole bunch of apparently ephemeral material was brought into the museum in the early 70s by curators who seemed to have been convinced that all of these otherwise everyday objects would soon be outmoded by the rapid pace of development and change under the Amin government. And in 1976 and 1977, the Amin government, for the first time, laid in plans to develop a proper modernized archive building. There was a consultant from UNESCO brought in who prepared a lengthy report describing a plan for a modern archive in Uganda with a staff of 60 people. Here, then, was a mode of archival and historic preservation that was animated in many ways by a sense of momentum, by a feeling apparently sincere that the tides of history were shifting. There were many wars to fight and win, 
a campaign to increase cotton growing, a campaign to Africanize the economy. All of these campaigns were generating their own momentum, their own paperwork, their own headlines, and their own archives. In 1986, the current government of Uganda, called the National Resistance Movement, came to power after a bloody guerrilla war. The new government of Uganda had very little time for the past. The leader of Uganda, the current president, Yoweri Museveni, was a committed student of leftist politics. He had studied history and politics at uh, the University of Dar es Salaam. Uh, he and other men of the NRM saw themselves as avatars of a new era in history whose role it was to launch Uganda into a future in which the benighted past would play no enduring role. In fact, the NRM government in the 80s and today regards Uganda's conflicted history as a hindrance to progress. They've generally sought to direct citizens' attention toward what they depict as a bright and promising future, not toward a dark and divisive past. Remarkably, there are today in Uganda no monuments to honor the many people who perished during the political tumults of the 1970s and early 80s. The Uganda Museum, which is the only public museum in the country, is under immediate threat of closure as government plans to turn, to requisition the land and turn the museum premises into a high-rise 60-story commercial building. President Museveni periodically makes clear his disdain for the study of history. In, 19, or sorry, in 2014, for instance, he told the university audience that many universities continue teaching very useless courses at the degree level and went on to decry the study of history as a waste of time. That's all a way of explaining why, in the early 2000s, when I first started working in Uganda, so many of, archives were, of, of the archives in which I worked were endangered. It's not to say that these archives had never been valuable, that they'd never been subject to custodianship or oversight. As I've argued, they've, they were once critical to the maintenance of exclusionary regimes of information, and access to them was carefully monitored and controlled. But by the late 20th century, in the wake of the history-making revolution in Uganda, the archives had become trash, leftovers from an old and embarrassing order. That's why so many of Uganda's archives were, in the 2000s, kept in a dangerous state. It's not that they were simply uh, left to rot. The neglect of the historical infrastructure was, for the Museveni government, a way of drawing a line between the past and the present, of separating the contemporary order from a dangerous and traumatic history. There's a kind of state-imposed amnesia, in other words, which accounts for the disorder of the paper record. Very, very recently, let me talk about this very quickly. Uh, in 2016, the World Bank uh, finished work on a newly built archive building funded and organized entirely by the World Bank and, and uh, opened up in the center of Kampala. It is a lovely building. There's fire suppression equipment. There's five cold rooms in the basement where fragile materials can be kept. There's an elevator. There's a room specifically dedicated to digitization. There's even a fountain, as you can see. It's hard to overstate the distance between this new building and the old place where the Uganda National Archives was previously kept in the basement below this nondescript uh, administrative structure in Entebbe. Every uh, uh, day, this glorious new structure is being filled up with papers that are being brought into it by government ministries, which have long been keeping and accumulating records in ministerial repositories around the country. But it remains unclear what the commitments of government are going to be to this newly constructed building. Today, a year and a half after its opening, the Uganda National Archives staff establishment stands at three people. The new building is glorious and large, but there are no shelves on which to hold the majority of the files. Neither are there desks or chairs on which researchers can sit. The staff does not have computers. The air conditioner works in principle, but the costs of running it far outstrip the institution's meager budget, so the air conditioning is normally kept off. Thousands of new material are accumulating in the repository, as you can see, but there's no staff to undertake the work of cataloging or organizing this newly acquired material. Most of it is sitting on the floor in the repository itself. Toward the middle of last year, the building, the first floor of the building was occupied by a new government office, the Land Commission, 
depriving the archive staff of their access to offices, their library, and their search room. In other words, it's not yet clear what this glorious new building means for Uganda's archival infrastructure or for its scholars. There's a real prospect that this impressive structure will become something like a white elephant, a dumping ground for disused government paperwork, a new and more glorious means of forgetting and burying the past. Now, there's a vast distance in scale and ambition between the digital archives that I've helped to create in Fort Portal and the massive new building that's been opened up in Kampala. Uh, but both projects are alike in their ambition to promote open access and their interesting interest in promoting and enabling researchers to investigate and deliberate over the past. Both of them have been funded by external sources, and both projects are today, in some senses, in peril as government, whether through neglect or through legal action, inhibits open access to their holdings. I started this lecture by uh, suggesting that librarians and archivists in the global north ought not see ourselves as prospectors, tapping for or mining for hitherto untapped sources of information that we can export to the global north. In Uganda, as in other, every other part of the global south, there are histories of custodianship that have structured and determined the shape of the contemporary archival landscape. Even the most apparently decrepit archives were one, at one time pruned, edited, organized, and superintended by British and Af African archivists who nervously sought to control and superintend access to official information. My success suggestion here is that for reasons that are both ethical and practical, we ought to separate digitization projects from demands on open access. I'm a great believer in the necessity of digitization. Paper archives have a limited shelf life, especially in places where storage is less than ideal and where humidity is high. But I do think that digitization should uh, not necessarily lead toward the opening up of hitherto closed collections to global information consumers or toward the vacuuming up of African archival materials into a global information supply chain. What we need, I think, are localized digital technologies that is media infrastructures that allow local authorities to work with researchers and outsiders to control access, limit information, and keep secrets in some sense. Transparency and open access are laudable ideals, but especially in places uh, like Uganda, where traumatic history presses in upon the present, it might be the duty of information managers to help, to help to find ways to close things off. Thanks very much. I think I have a few minutes for questions. Is that right? That was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, so I'm just wondering about the politics around uh, sort of erasing the past consciously, uh, you know, trying to eradicate the evidence of the past. And, and it's, it looks to me like the efforts, both your efforts that you were involved with and the new archive building and the piling up of stuff there, it's true that the materials seem to be endangered, but just the accumulation in one place probably makes it a little bit harder politically hmm. to simply eradicate all of it at once. Whereas if it's out in little district uh, headquarters or whatever, it might have been easier to erase all of it. So simply the piling up may have some hmm. preservation benefit in the long run. Hmm. Wondering about that. That's an issue. Uh, I, my inclination generally has been to think the opposite, actually. Uh, largely because in, tr in places that have tumultuous histories, government buildings very often get sacked in the capital, uh, as they have in many, many occasions in Uganda's history. Kampala has been sacked, uh, you know, repeatedly. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm, in, I'm nervous myself about the consolidation of papers in a centralized repository simply because it's easy to find and destroy a lot of stuff e quickly um, if you're an incoming uh, movement that wants to uh, undermine the previous government's legitimacy. I, one of the reasons why Uganda has such a rich trace of paper archives, even though its history is so tumultuous, is that stuff was forgotten in the way that I described in the first part of my talk. It was tucked away in places where it was hard to find. The wasps ad acted effectively as custodians. Uh, you know, the pile of 
junk in the entrance place to the, that basement repository effectively barred access to people who might otherwise have been interested in destroying archival paperwork. There actually is, for preservation purposes, in, 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 in contexts where uh, the political order is unsettled, there's a lot to be said about decentralization and inaccessibility as necessary conditions for preservation. So, you know, I, I hope that you're right and that having everything in one place will in some sense make it incumbent on government to find a way to conserve and digitize or however to clean up this material and to act as a custodian for it. But, it, you know, at the same time, centralizing everything also makes it more available uh, in a way that might make it, render it precarious, so. What is, um, if you could just elaborate, what is available in Hounslow Park, and if so, is any of that accessible? So in 2012 and 13, the British government made available 8,000 files that had been kept back in Hanslow Park. They were carefully redacted by a committee that was headed by a historian, a former colleague of mine. Uh, and it's been made, the whole Hanslow Park disclosure, as it's called, was made available in the British National Archives in 2013, 2014. Uh, under the uh, number FCO 141, which holds all of the material that was vacuumed out of decolonizing African and Asian uh, states and brought off to London on the occasion of decolonization. Yeah. Whether there's more material that's been kept back, where it's not yet clear. There's the prospect of a lot more material that was kept back by the Ministry of Defense, which hasn't yet been fully, you know, described or or uh, identified in public as far as I know. Um, but uh, at least the Hansel Park material is now available. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Would you say that you did the same thing with the French colonies? Well, my sense is that French archival practice was more centralized than in the British context. Um, and that more papers, that a greater percentage of the total government archive accumulated in places like Dakar uh, than was the place, was the case in the British context where in each district government and within each county, in fact, there were often archival repositories that were set up because the British were so given to um, distributing authority to what in the system was called indirect rule in which each local authority had an administrative staff at his or her uh, disposal. So, you know, I don't know for sure. I've not tried to do archival reclamation work in, in French Africa, but intuitively I would suspect that, th that the archival record would be more centralized, uh, but I don't know for sure, yeah. Hello. Um, from what has been preserved and what hasn't, and like looking at that room, do you have an idea of the percentage of what's gone completely missing? And I'm asking because I was here three years ago for the Leviathan Conference about U.S. government information, which is no longer available. And this is positively optimistic because at least you can measure and have sense, sense of what once was there, even if they burned that building down. At least you know, well, this many boxes of stuff by estimation is gone, whereas we don't seem to have any of that hope at all. So it's just right. by, I'm sort of by comparison, I'm trying to understand how bad is that situation in, in, in sort of in your, in your estimation compared to what other na nations, perhaps more organized or older democracies have experienced versus um, this very unhappy situation? Yeah, I mean, I, so I was on an ARC uh, panel a, year, a couple of years ago with the U.S. National Archivist who uh, was, made it clear to me that the situation in the U.S. National Archives is not dramatically better than, than it is in the Ugandan situation. <laughs> Um, in that there's a vast shortfall, as you've indicated, in the U.S. archives staff ability to organize and make accessible government information. I don't remember what the number was that, that he, he offered up, but um, I can say that for the Ugandan case, the papers of central government have not been organized or made accessible since 1961, uh, because that is when the British closed the National Archives in Antebe because it was full. Uh, that was when Operation Legacy had more or less run its course. Thereafter, ministries, after independence in 1962, began accumulating papers in ministerial headquarters that were not open for research or access. They were, in some cases, open for consultancy by 
uh, ministerial workers. What's coming into the National Archives? All of this stuff that you see on the screen are ministerial papers that have been generated since the early 60s. Um, and there's just a lot of stuff. I, I have the very, very distinct impression that all of the cataloging work that we've done over the course of the past 10 years pales in comparison with the task ahead, simply because this new National Archives building is so big and it's already so full <laughs> of stuff. And so it's a daunting task. As, again, the staff establishment in Kampala at the moment is three people. So you know, there's a real job ahead here. Um, thank you very much for that um, amazing talk. I wanted to know whether um, you were aware of what sort of agreement the World Bank had with the Ugandan government uh, before funding this building. Uh, what sort of arrangement had they agreed to? Because um, it just looks at this point like an imposition of a building, and that's all that it is. But I'm sure there's a lot more behind it. Yeah, it was, it's a long story. Uh, the funding was allocated about 12 years before the building was finalized. There was a lot of back and forth about what the building would look like um, and how fully it would be equipped. In the end, in 2016, the World Bank handed on to the Ministry of Public Service this lovely structure without any furniture, as you will have seen, without any equipment. It's a, it's a straight, great building, but again, there's, there, there's nothing in it to help facilitate the work of actually you know, acting as a custodian of these collections. The agreement that the World Bank struck with the, the government is basically that this building ought to be used for the furtherance of, uh, you know, um, the, the name in which, the program in which it was launched within the bank's funding model was to promote transparency uh, and, in government information access. The, it's all meant to be a vehicle by which uh, government records will be more effectively kept. The prospect is the bank hopes that the Uganda government will increasingly operate uh, through electronic media and not on paper uh, and thus promote more easy access for citizens to government records. The archives, the paper archive was kind of an add-on to the project which was put, uh, made, it, was, it was added, as I understand it, uh, at the insistence of uh, a World Bank archivist named Darlene Seed, who was an extremely public-spirited individual and who did as best as she could to get a big structure opened up for the Ugandan archives to use to hold the paper records, often against the impulses of bureaucrats in Washington and in Kampala who wanted to make it uh, a building with a different purpose altogether. So, you know, it's kind of half a loaf as opposed to a whole loaf. It's a great building, but there are serious doubts about whether it can effectively act as an archival repository, as a, as a functioning accessible archive, given the constraints that I talked about earlier, and given also the fact that increasingly the building is being partitioned up for other ministries to use. Hey. Hey. Thank you for all the work you're doing. Can you talk about a little, can you um, draw out the point that you were making at the end of your talk about the desideratum for digitization without um, access? And especially, I'm thinking about Ugandan citizens' uh, interest in having their own history. Uh, you showed the Kenyan um, a, pro a protester. So maybe talking about access to their own records and, and what that drive is like and, and how that competes with yeah. this. No, I'm happy to say, I mean, the digital repository that the CRL has helped to create in Western Uganda is being used by Ugandan citizens and researchers to write masters and PhD thesis projects. Students at the university can access it, at Mountains of the Moon University can access it. And researchers from outside can use it if they go to Fort Portal and, and work at that terminal. Um, I hope that in some future uh, I'll be able to work with the ministry to make some part of that collection available to CRL users in agreement with the Uganda government, but it's going to take time. The, the building of this new structure in Kampala has meant that the ministry responsible for the archives has taken a renewed interest in provincial and district archives and thus is exerting legal authority over a district collection that it had previously largely ignored. And that's the kind of administrative context in which the the digital archive currently sits. Uh, 
uh, whether, whether I hope that access to some part of that collection will soon be made available for researchers who go through the CRL interface and indeed also to Ugandans who are, don't come to Fort Portal. How that will look, I don't yet know. Thank you very much. Sorry, excuse me, excuse me. Derek, I, I do want to just um, highlight one point that funding for the West Africa, sorry, the, the Western Ugandan part of that project came from CAMP. Yeah, right. And I think we must um, acknowledge that, yeah, even right. though you've mentioned it, but you keep on calling it a CRA, CRL project, right. and it, it is an actual fact a CAMP project. Fair enough. Yes, Thank you. That's right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.